Okay, so welcome everyone uh, to episode 76, uh, our paediatric case study um, episode, which we're pretty excited about because we've done multiple ped episodes before, four of the six on the panel of, of our, our previous guests and friends of the show. Um, we'll, we'll introduce everyone in a minute. And the PEDS episode is always super, super popular, either because it's a, an, in, an interesting, fascinating topic, or perhaps it's a topic that um, people will want to know more about because they, they feel particularly uh, weak in that area. I definitely count myself in, um, in that category for sure. So uh, in no particular audio, we'll say hello and thank you to our Aussie guests first because they're all the ones up at 5 a.m. Kylie, who everyone knows, I'm sure, from episode four, did all the way back in episode four, Kylie, we're now at 76 and here we are. Um, and you, you did episode four, four for us. Alicia, episode 28. Um, and newcomer, Anthony, welcome and thank you for joining us at 5 a.m. as well. Um, and then from the UK, Nina, again, did episode 38. And I'm, really, I'm saying these numbers so that people can go back and watch them. James, does your episode count, James? Episode 50, it was an absolute shit show, wasn't it? We were just it dicking was, around. It was um, quite clearly the best Podchat Live episode ever, with Toby, obviously. No one learned um, anything. So maybe we, maybe this is your newcomer to the show. No, this is your second show. And, <laughs> and, you can, and really delighted to have Matthew with us as well. So thanks for joining us, Matthew. Um, so we've got our dream team, our panel of six, uh, Three from Oz, three from the UK, three female, three male. We feel like we've got a nice balance and we're going to pitch some case studies to them um, and see how they, uh, how they sort of address these things. And I have it on reasonable authority that they don't always agree, which, which we love, which is, which is great, of course. Um, if you're watching and you've got any ideas, uh, cases, thoughts, um, patients of your own that you want to sort of quickly, you know, pump to these guys while, while they're here, captive audience, bang them in the comments and we'll try and get to them. Um, we've got a few case studies that have come in beforehand anyway, but before we get to them, I might just do the, the real quick thing of talking about COVID-19 coronavirus, if that's okay with you guys. Just a couple of PEDS related um, queries. We don't have to spend too much time on them, but I think the first one, and, and we probably need a UK take and an Aussie take on this, is um, what does the PEDS service look like at this time, given the global climate, given the discussion about what's essential, what's non-essential? Um, is there much of a PEDS service kind of going on? If I pump that to the UK uh, panellists first, and then they can pass on to Oz when they're ready. Oh, um, uh, James, you're probably the best one at this moment. Well, then, yeah. um, well, it depends on the area where you work in, but it, at the moment it seems all to be based on uh, urgent and emergency responses and would be delayed by a period of time. There was a piece for anyone who's on the Children's Podiatry Special Advisory Group. There was a post um, about five or six days ago is urgent and it's actually if you give me a second and I will I'll just grab it um, and I'll show you the piece uh, and for those of us that don't see kids James what 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 is an urgent what what, what come what what is classed as urgent and non-urgent in, in the pediatric can, world Griff can you see my screen yes yeah, got yeah it. we can see it okay so this is the the piece that was just released um, uh, 11th of April and it's from NHS England and it's themes as emergency conditions, we have non-accidental injury, which covers all your child abuse and at-risk children, which is clearly right at the top, and also your infections, osteomyelitis, and then under your urgent, you've got your slipped upper femoral or capital femoral epiphysis, malignancy, so obviously your, your, your non-remitting night pain or worsening swelling, and then your in acute inflammatory uh, processes. Juvenile, suspected juvenile arthritis, autoimmune connective disorders, dermatosomiosis, and suspected inflammatory spinal pain. And then if you go further down, it pretty much in the section at the bottom here says, you can leave it if it doesn't come under the stuff above, um, unless you have real, real suspicions or real concerns. I'll, I'll ping this across so you can put it in your links, after, but it's on the children's podiatry page already. I don't know if anyone had anything else to add. I think it covers all of it, doesn't it, really? So um, I think, yeah, I see, because I think both myself and Nina aren't in that much paediatric clinical practice at the moment, with myself being in research and only doing one day a month at the moment. And then Nina's working within, is it chronic conditions at the moment? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'm not doing any clinics at the moment, so I'm not a good one to ask for that one. <laughs> <laughs> 
why we ask these two panelists to come in. But I mean, <laughs> if we, um, if we, I mean, if you take a look at that document, as I understand, understood it from mm. a perspective, as well, it kind of looks as I assume they're looking at a twelve-week window because that's what they're looking for at the at the moment. In between, um, sort of like lockdown, it's going to be a twelve-week window. So they're looking at anything that can happen temporarily, anything that can deteriorate within that twelve-week window, I suppose. So if you were looking at something like Tarsal Coalition, okay, that is something that needs to be treated, but is it something that is likely to, te to, to deteriorate within that 12-week window? So my take from that is it's, 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 it's looking at things that can show long-term chronic change or deterioration within those 12 weeks. So if we were looking at a minor neurological disorder, yes, these things need to be picked up, but they don't need to be picked up within that 12-week window. As far as I'm that's my that's my take on it uh, i don't know if anybody else has got any other takes on it at all they should imagine that's it i think they're just looking at things that could potentially worsen within that 12 weeks and what we need, that's certainly what we need to act on and that's a uk document or is that is that does that apply to our australia colleagues or is that a, a, a uh, that was probably not NHS. controlled by the nhs <laughs> well no 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 but i mean the philosophies behind it <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Step in and talk to, to, talk to us about. I know you're you're doing a lot of work on what's essential and not at the moment, Kylie. So maybe you could give us a your, uh, take, your hot take. I actually no. I'd go to Anthony first. Anthony works in a children's hospital, so ah, perfect. perfect. A, a, Australian's health system is very different to the NHS, so we don't pull out global recommendations. But and what are you doing with your your work? Yeah. So essentially, we moved everything to telehealth. Um, because I was explaining to James prior to most people coming online that um, because a lot of the um, babies aren't being seen on the wards for things like telepies, etc. So my public caseload has gone to pretty much 100% um, positional telepies assessments um, because they're not being seen. There's certain maternal child health nurses um, that aren't seeing um, babies face to face, nice. uh, certain GPs that aren't seeing babies face to face at the moment. So we're pretty much that first point of call for some of those uh, physical um, assessments. In, and I'm running that clinic with a physiotherapist at the moment. Um, and that's essentially where my priority has been from a, a public health um, job at the moment. Cool. And how's telehealth working with, uh, you know, remote consultations working with a paediatric caseload? Because I know a lot of people with adult caseloads are finding you it different and challenging in new ways and obviously kids are, are different and challenging at the best of times how's that how's that playing out i, I actually quite like it um but i think that the it all comes in, in your planning so if you know exactly what you're going to be seeing and you're seeing it repeatedly as well like in terms of those positional therapies that we're we're viewing um you can ask parents for a fairly well-defined setup um, that makes it easy for you to do the consult um, and it makes it easy for the parent to manhandle their child. So as long as you're going with a lot of pre-planning, I guess that's an advantage. The issue has been in, is around um, we've got a lot of our schools obviously doing schooling from home and internet connection in some areas are very, is very poor at the moment um, and lagging. So although families may have great devices, um, that internet connection and that lag can sometimes be there still. Um, so I'm finding that actually the biggest concern rather than the actual doing assessments at the moment on children. Um, from a private practice point of view, been doing telehealth as well and finding it really good to just touch base with a lot of families, progress exercise programs, etc. So I'm finding that really, really beneficial. Cool. And last coronavirus global pandemic topic question, I promise. But we have to give a bit of attention to it because it's been spoken about a lot in, in the various forums, these, these query skin manifestations, um, particularly in, in more, more sort of younger, younger sort of patients. Can anyone speak to their understanding of what we know about this, what we don't know about this, uh, how much we should be sort of not getting too carried away or whether we should really be sort of taking this seriously? I think, um, who was I speaking to offline about this? Was it you, Kylie, or maybe, Maybe it was someone in the group said they, they, they can speak to this a little bit. I think you were speaking to all of us, but I, I think the UK colleagues have probably a better handle on it. But 
what we've seen, we're not seeing um, a lot of manifestations of anything here. We've, we've stomped on the curve. Um, one of the challenges though, whenever we find out something new that is case-based is we need to be very cautious and we need to be cautious about, is it actually related to what we think it might be related to? We need to be really pragmatic around what the other signs and symptoms are. Um, it, it, most kids are at home and um, on, I don't want to be too out there, but if there's spots on skin on feet, they're probably not the least of the worries if it's um, COVID-19 uh, and being really cautious that if your child's showing anything else, that that's actually a reason for seeking medical care. Um, I think there's a lot that we will learn about it and, and some of our European colleagues are setting up registries and um, dermatologists and um, vascular colleagues are also looking at it with interest, but that's really where it is um, from all the reading that I've done at the moment. So unless the others had had more, I thought I saw something else come out. Yeah, there's, I mean, most of the case reports are coming out of Spain and a little bit out of Italy, mm -hmm. where they've got, obviously yeah. got a much higher prevalence. Speaking of registries, I just got an alert right now of yet another foot COVID registry being set up. Yeah. So a lot of people are jumping on it to collect case reports. And, and yeah. And I think you need really high population numbers to collect that sort of yeah. information. And you need mm -hmm. the ability for people to actually um, uh, be able to look at that sort of thing. And when there's someone is in respiratory distress, spots on their feet is actually the least of their problems. So uh, I, I think we also need to be really, um, really pragmatic about where it sits in the, the hierarchy. Uh, it's similar to the priorities about what's coming into our clinics. I'm only working in private right now. And for a child to get through my doors right now, they have to have a really bad ingrown toner. And anything else, um, because that will potentially escalate to a GP. Um, and I'm seeing an increase of them. I don't, these little people are a bit stressed and all picking their toenails. Um, <laughs> however, the, um, the, all the other stuff is telehealth. Perfect, right. Let's get on, let's pretend like the world isn't on fire and talk, talk about some thing that you, you know, some, some cases like that we're all much more interested in hearing about, I'm sure. So, with the panel assembled, we thought we'd get stuck into straight into case one, which is everyone's favorite idiopathic um, toe walking. And I do idiopathic like that so that Kylie doesn't give me daggers and things. But let's, let's call this patient Sally, because that's her name. And she's six years old. She's been diagnosed as an idiopathic toe walker by her pediatrician. She's seen another allied health professional and the management was stretching and orthoses. Her parents are worried because she is tripping and she is still toe walking as well. Um, there's another section to it, but with that information thus far, quick question um, to, to the panel and just dive in and, and take it as you wish. Consultation priorities with this, uh, this kind of pre presentation. Who wants to go first? I'll let you fight over it. Okay. <laughs> Kylie has to go first. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds <asylum. Wow>. um, <laughs> the, the consultation priorities is making sure the diagnosis is correct or that all, um, there are so many reasons that children can walk on their tiptoes. Toe walking is commonly a symptom um, rather than a diagnosis. It's only when you get idiopathic toe, toe walking is kind of when you've ruled everything out. And um, one of the biggest challenges is a lot of the conditions that cause toe walking can change over time. And so while you can um, commonly trust your colleagues, um, it doesn't mean you don't reassess and you don't reassess um, particular things that it might have presented one way when they were three and now it's presenting a little bit differently. So for me, the, the top is and we've got um, articles that we can shoot people, particularly the toe walking tool, about how not to meet, how not to miss a diagnosis. Cool. Uh, I think if my Google searching stalk, slash stalking is correct, Tony, your current PhD is on toe walking as well. 
Is that correct? Have I, have I researched yes. correctly? Yeah, Thank God. Yeah, I, I, I nearly, I nearly looked tiny. professional. Um, so yeah, yeah uh, Anthony. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, what, what, anything, anything, to, anything to add? Uh, anything to add? Um, yeah, I think once you've got your diagnosis, I obviously, I go with um, what their goals are regarding why they're coming to see you. Because sometimes some of those long-term goals of, oh, we don't want our child to toe walk, sometimes that's not even an, un, an achievable goal to attain. So sometimes I break it down and go, well, how is the toe walking affecting this child on a day-to-day -day basis? Like, it, can they stand on one leg to kick a footy or a soccer ball? Can they squat down to do particular activities? Can they, what, what are they challenged with? And, and work on those kind of things at the same time. Um, if we work on anything at all, um, sometimes it's a bit of a watch and wait situation. If there's no functional um, goals out there to, to work towards. Perfect. Anyone from the UK wants to chime in? James, you're, I guess uh, we'll, we'll ask uh, maybe Matthew and Nina from a, from a research perspective in a bit, but clinically, um, what are your priorities in these kind of I cases? Think, I think possibly it's, which I know I've discussed with everyone on the panel, about expectation. So, and Anthony touched on it just there, is why have they come in to see you? Is it the child that's decided that they've come in or is it the concerned parent is thinking, little Johnny here is walking on their tiptoes to me, Sally. that is a problem. Her name's Sally. Okay. <laughs> well, Sally, that the parent has brought them in and they have the concern, but they don't know anything else. So they're looking for you for reassurance, expertise, and, and those expectations or those goal settings. In this case, it may be that just might be the, the case with that child, or it could be a whole host of other things that Kylie's alluded to. I think perfect. I think I would talk to actually come back to from a clinical perspective uh, from what Kylie said. It's like, you know, what it's associated with and um, are there any changes? Has there been any changes over time as well? Because I have seen idiopathic toe walkers who did fall within the criteria of that. But because things had changed, she stopped, uh, somebody was complaining of buzzing in the feet and then she started to have a uh, uh, urinary urge. Um, things were obviously weren't just adding up on to the fact that they were, you know, it was an idiopathic toe walker and it turned out they had a spinal cord tether. But it, it's because we kept them under review and you have to, you have to reassess your, your diagnosis, I feel. And, that, and I think that's quite important what Kylie, Kylie says. And sometimes you have to ask for things outside of normally what you'd consider to be a uh, musculoskeletal questions or what you would classify as typical neurological um, so you might have to ask for neurological control from other settings such as like um, uh, fecal continence and urinary continence and I think they're just they're really important questions to ask when you're dealing with um, toe walkers um, you know and I think you pick a lot up but if you, you work alongside pediatricians in the hospital I don't know if you've got anything else to work on that Kylie. I don't, I don't even think it's just in your toe walkers I think it depends on all that if, if you think about those kids that get referred to you who've been told that they are hypermobile and they come into their clinic and they've got that little tag and actually you can ask you can go down the same issues of continence and things like that where the parents will say actually if I, and I've got to find somewhere right now and they'll also be saying look I've been in pain for years I don't know why it's in so many joints or it might be so or they can't do their shoes up or they can't do their buttons up on their shirt There's, it, it's so multifactorial rather than looking at the foot or the leg or the the gait etc i just yeah yeah i think that's sorry i'm over talking but it's like kylie and nina have always said to me when i think so it's like review and you know review because kids change so fast um and um, you know pick up on on these things and things should never regress things should never regress so that's no. always that's always your red flag um, anything that's plateauing like any sort of like motor skills or any sort of developmental skills that are plateauing or regressing that's always a red flag so you know these things are always to check so i think review is important yeah. i any... think those, those children that do come back when they've already been under another service though mm. um from my experience sometimes they're not perhaps happy with the diagnosis or they think it's something else or they'll still see the toe walking but there's other things going on and they can't always articulate 
their concerns. So I think it's always important to ask about other aspects of the development as well, be it the speech, the language, the social communication, all those other things. Because like you, uh, everyone's been saying, it's that, that picture that builds. And I think really it's just getting to the bottom of it and starting those conversations early on. What is it that's causing your concern? You know, what difference would you like to see? How can we help you? It's just trying to um, open those conversations up with those open questions, um, just to get to the bottom of well, what, what, what's bringing you to another service. Um, but obviously, it is a case of uh, checking the diagnosis and every, everything that everyone said. Uh, that was my my addition. <laughs> okay. So a bit more info for you as well uh, in the case. So Sally. Um, is not uh, worried about not keeping up with her friends. She struggles mm -hmm. to get, get onto her scooter and ride it, but she can get her heels to the ground. Um, so sub-question after that bit of information is, what are the management priorities slash management options here? <laughs> it sounds silent. Record on what they want to achieve. <laughs> mm. My thing will come back to what 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 is the goal for this period of time? So what's the focus want to be? Um, because it might be someone might sit back and go, "Oh, they have to get their heels to the ground." Well, if they can't do do those things, I'm not convinced they're getting their heels to the ground in the true sense. We're doing a fire another another movement or another compensation. But at the same time, do they need to get that heel to the ground to achieve that skill? Because they may not. Riding a bike, you probably find they can get away without it. But we've got heaps of work to do on balance and control. So my thing is, what, what are we looking for? What are we trying to achieive? And my thing would be, if, we're, have we, if we have ruled out neurological or if we haven't, setting them up with a bunch load of stretches you're yeah, setting the child up to fail if you haven't ruled out that neurological condition because there's nothing worse as a parent. If you tell me to stretch that child again, even though I've got him to brush his teeth, I'm really excited, he's never going to achieve it. So you, it, it, you kind of give him negative feedback before you can even get towards a positive outcome. More and more we're seeing more evidence come out that stretching isn't overly effective, that mm. stretching doesn't long-term change things. It's, um, it's, it's super, Alicia's so right, as a parent, getting your child to do something, it's hard enough to get them to brush their teeth some days and wear clothes outside the house. Yep. Um, so add in another feature, like you must stretch, what is five minutes going to do in a child's day? And for, for I, I, I realise some people go, it's part of the treatment plan, it's just not. It's an absolute waste of a parent's time unless they're going to back that stretching up with strength and back it up with movement and back it up with so many other things that takes hours. And unless that is part of um, your parenting style and parenting capacity and parenting ability, because that is how you work at home and um most parents, that isn't their sole focus and they don't have the capacity. And if your treatment program sets a child up to fail, you truly aren't a, a child first practitioner. And you should probably go and move on to sports because those guys want to change and they will often do everything that you say because they want to be better. Whereas a parent just wants to be a better parent. And if you give them something that is going to set them up for failure, like Alicia said, then you actually aren't doing them any favours at all. Anyone on the panel, um, just to try and generate some controversy, anyone on the panel pro stretching? Or we got six or, or you know, six non non fans of stretching, both evidence and clinically based here. I wouldn't say I'm against it. I I'm would, about trying to find where it fits. Yeah. If that makes sense. I, I would I would use it occasionally in a, in an acute setting, but not not long term. Because mm -hmm. as Kylie just said, they just to to get them to do it for a week, fine. But to get them to do it for six months, that's not going to happen. It isn't. Yeah, I'll, I'll, some of the kids that are really quite tight, and you probably want them to be casted. Um, yeah. Sometimes I <laughs> set kids up because sometimes they're so tight that 
you're not even sure that while they wait for a neuro assessment or an orthopedic review or casting, etc. Sometimes I'll just ask kids to stretch just to see. But how how do you do it? Oh, what yeah, sort of I, stretch? I, yeah, I, I, yeah. Look, I modify how the stretch gets done because sometimes you find the asymmetries after the fact. Yeah. They present to you one way. But as you're going through like a bit of a rehab program with them, you're finding the asymmetries present themselves that weren't there initially. Um, and that's sometimes what I've found. Anthony, as Kylie said, how do you get them to stretch though? What do you do to encourage them to actually do the stretch? Because for so some of the kids that I've used it in in the past, say, say the lads like the same age as my son. My son's 11 and... He loves his sports, but he also could spend all day playing computer games without fail yeah. if I didn't stop him. So you get him to stand on a stretch board whilst playing PlayStation. So he'll stand there and go, right, you've got to stand there. You can blow things to smithereens, but you stand on the board. Okay, now you're convinced you're doing it. He doesn't think so. He's still playing computer games. I'm just curious as to how the kids that you do get to do it, what you do to encourage them. Yeah, so I do a lot, lot of active um, range of motion stuff as well. Um, and that's probably more where I, 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 it is great to get kids to do some active stretching, but I do more um, active range of motion activities. Um, Bear walk. They, yeah, even like things like where they're having to squat a lot and do different activities where you, you've got, you know, the antagonist agonists kind of working. Um, Mainly because I also find that it's really hard unless they're going to sit in front of a computer or TV to get kids to be stationary for that period of time. Um, it's just also finding what works for that child. So I would play parents. around with it. And, and those, yeah. yeah, and those parents. Like, um, but yeah, if you've got I, a parent I, that loves to go, sorry, Ant. Oh, no, no, it was just following up. That, that, that's pretty much it. You've got to work with the individual. Um, and one, there is no algorithm for this at all. Um, I hate algorithms anyway, but yeah, there is no algorithm at all for this. Do you have to say climbing up slides? Yeah. Like I've got a five-year-old boy that loves, like you've told him the whole time, you're not allowed to climb up a slide. And now you've given me permission. you tell him that? <laughs> oh, no, I'm that parent. But you're not giving him permission to do something like he's not allowed to do. Like that is the ultimate version of stretching or participation. Um, yeah. I think you've got to build those kind of things in because you become a little bit of a hero in that child's mind as well because mum said no and huh, now it's part of my program. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I think, Can we, I think that kind of stuff's important. It has to be fun. Yeah. Can we it's challenge boring, again? What Sorry. you're stretching and why? Like, That's let's go back to what you're stretching and why. If a child is toe walking for 12 hours, 15 minutes of stretching is not going to work because they are toe walking for 11 hours and 45 minutes. So this is where um, different games, different ch children. Um, I, I'm watching things on the other other side of it. Some someone I think has mentioned that children are soft and stretchy. Well, they're soft and stretchy when they're healthy. Um, that, that's, that's the way they are. Um, they are soft and stretchy. If they're not, they're actually, there's some abnormal pathology going on that we need to uh, address in some way. And this is why serial casting works. We've talked around all the soft management, but when things don't work, then Ant mentioned it um, just before around if we're waiting for serial casting, getting a cast on a child for 24 hours a day for, for six weeks is going to stretch those muscles. We've got evidence that it actually works. Um, it changes the muscle length, but we don't have evidence that it changes the function. And over and over, we're talking about what children can do, and that's a totally different question. If we, if we want to see the child get their heels to the ground and have appropriate length, then we've got to work on, on strength and goals with, with the parent. Cool. Anyone, before we move on cases, anyone got any other gems or pearls about toe walking uh, that they want to sort of throw in just before we move on? I see Kylie's hand I've up. Got, 
I've got yeah, one go. more. Go. Um, uh, just going back to what everyone was talking about before, as parents, you're used to talking about who and we a lot. And as a podiatrist, you never think you're going to really talk about that. It is so left of field that it is something more and more in children's practice from a developmental or from a neurological, um, from hypermobility and, and from some of the conditions that actually cause toe walking. You need to be okay with asking the questions you never thought you were gonna to have to ask because it's not about feet, it's all about the child as a whole. And one developmental milestone that all children go through, when you see them young, they are not toilet trained. When you see them older, they are toilet trained. So regression or achievement of toileting um, and even nighttime toileting, and there's lots of little kids that still are wetting the bed or not unable to hold in urine overnight until seven, eight, nine. Um, that isn't abnormal. It may be something that they want to talk to their GP about, but understanding where a skill has regressed, they had it and then they lost it, is a real, or they're not achieving it by a typical time. So generally for daytime wetting, it, it's, it's between three and five um, or before they go to school. It's really, really important to um, understand those sort of things. I'll Perfect. Leave it there. Great. No, that's great. Um, so, case number two, if that's okay. This is, um, this, this child doesn't have a name, um, in this case at least. They are 18 months old. They hit all developmental milestones um, at appropriate times, but they were considered to be a slightly late walker. This is the parents' words. They started walking at about 15, 16 months. They're walking maybe two months. Um, there's no pain, there's no guarding, there's no, no nothing sinister going on mechanically. To look at their feet, there are no skin lesions, but the parents are the ones who are worried and concerned about the curly toes. In particular, both fifths in this uh, fairly classic adducto varus position. Could, could the panel give us some insights on their approaches, their thoughts, um, you know, how they, I guess, deal with both the child and the parent in this case? It's quite an interesting one because you would kind of um, think that the, the two are perhaps not connected. So um, I suppose it's really asking, first of all, um, what, what is it that you think is causing the issue? It's about the, the beliefs as to why that presentation has happened. Um, it, you mentioned in it, um, it's uh, whenever I get children who are late walkers and or they're, they're perhaps not walking as well as they should do, Yet the meeting all the other development milestones reminded me of a case of a child that um, actually had uh, developmental hip dysplasia. So it's always a it's a, a cue for me is that it's nothing to do with this uh, curly toe, by the way. But, um, <laughs> it's, so um, curly toes do not cause hip dysplasia. <laughs> no. Can we just be no, really, no, no, no. really, really just to be no, clear? Yes, it's not linked. It's not even it, linked. It's not even linked. It's not even linked. <laughs> so. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it was always a learning point for me and it helps me with my clinical reasoning is that if they're developing well in every other aspect, I always think of something orthopedic. Um, but yeah, the, the curly fifth toes, I, I suppose it's really, um, but for what reason have you told us uh, this information about them being a late walker? And are there any other things that are feeding those beliefs? It may be the curly toe, but is it something else about the development, etc.? So I'd really want to open up the conversation about it and what they think it might lead to you know is it that they think that they're in pain will it cause um, long-term issues you know so it's, it's unpicking that to start with I'm guessing um obviously it's a natural variance I can't see the toes but <laughs> anyone else <laughs> no okay <laughs> more to this story or uh, no, no, there's not. I mean, do you want, do you want me to make something up on the spot? <laughs> I can jump in if you, this was if you want this, a, a so blunt say, answer. This was, this, this was actually emailed to me by someone, and this was the only information I, I, I've got. So if I made this case up, I might add something to it now, but this is actually an email that someone sent me, so it's all I've got, I'm afraid. Yeah. Blunt yeah, blunt blunt I, I, I pretty much would just say you don't need to do anything if it's a concern at the age of 4C plastics and a concern is pain, nail issues, 
skin issues, footwear issues. That's essentially like I'd like as a short, blunt, kind of straightforward. If I was writing an exam paper, that's what I would write. I wouldn't touch it till four. I wouldn't bother um, unless there's those tick off points. I think it's one versus the other. And I think that's where Nina was talking about the, the late walking versus the toes. And I think watching everyone's faces, toes, none of us really care about these curly toes, but a parent does. And so hearing their concern and reassuring them that most curly toes get better with age, that some aunt, uncle, grandparent had a toe um, in a similar sort of position and I'm sure that they are fine and if they're not it can either be as Anthony suggested addressed when the child is older or it might be an issue when they're 70 and by then as a parent you're not going to be around to worry about any corn on a fifth toe that comes from a toe being curled around the corner it's not going to stop them running it's not going to stop them playing it's just a little curly toe and we all come in different shapes and sizes just like we come in all abilities and i like to challenge this notion of late because 15 months is not a late walker where everything else is coming and if they have these pre preconceptions um so early that their child needs to keep up to set time frames they are setting themselves up for a world of hurt throughout their parenting because children don't come with schedules they make their own they come with this span of time frames that they're meant to do stuff and so we'll i'll start to very gently challenge that at the same time that there's there's lots of time frames that we do stuff in i think what can help in these situations though um is getting them to take a, a photo record of it it just puts them back in the control in control if you like so i think sometimes as much as you can give people that reassurance it's not enough sometimes so uh, you know take a picture every couple of months or six months and and, and see if it's changing uh, yeah <laughs> it's a difficult one. i think we've spent more time on curly toes on this than we actually would in consults <laughs> <laughs> right i see that as a cue to move on then i will take that hint that massive hint and i'll move on to the case which Everyone's been waiting for, um, I'm sure, when, when, when it becomes clear what we're talking about. So, 12-year-old, plays football, a very, very keen footballing family. The, the dad is an ex-professional footballer himself. Yes. Um, the dad brings the 12-year-old in because, again, no, there's no pain, there's been no injury, but in his eye, his son looks clumsy. He just doesn't look like... He's, he's not as fast as he thinks he should be. He looks a bit clumsy. He doesn't look as as balanced and coordinated as perhaps some of the other players on, on the team. Um, it just so happens that the father-in-law is an orthopaedic surgeon who's taken a quick look Sunday lunchtime and told him he's flat-footed and he needs orthoses. Go. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like seeing 12-year-olds. Over to the you. The child guys. even likes sport. <laughs> Does the child like sport? The, child, the child's dad loves no 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 does the does the child like what <laughs> yeah. sport the child wants to make his dad happy the child plays football yeah absolutely does he we love actually football? do yeah. like parents we're not bagging parents <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just it's that moment of and i always have that moment when you've get, got the parent who is the professional potentially previously that there's two sets of genetics at play here is before we even go down that pathway, is the child heading that same pathway? Are we got some realistic expectations? Or is the child just playing because his mate's playing and he has a great time? Because he may never, ever be that person that that parent's looking for. Something yeah. to consider before you jump down a pathway of treating and what, what the goal is. Yeah. Let's say he loves football. He wants to be like his dad. Does that make that easy? Just, oh. just to make it a bit easier. Yeah. His dad's his hero. But we all send them then to Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> so, Ant, over to, over to you, mate. Off you go. <laughs> so, I guess I think I've actually, I, I've got this, I've actually got this same situation as a real, real one. Like the football with the, the uh, father in law that's an ortho. Um, uh, a lot of education, I guess. In terms of the clumsiness and that kind of stuff, like, I guess, like, you, what, what defines that i think like in, 
And that's where it comes to really, really good assessment um, in terms of, and space for your assessment. That's where I, I also feel that telehealth has been a really good um, addition under the current situations is, you know, having a look at what their agility and strength and balance and dynamic balance has been like, you know, define what is clumsy and what that father is telling you is clumsy. Is it because they're not agile enough on, if we're talking from a UK point of view, like a soccer pitch kind of situation, or is it just that he's been knocked off the ball too quickly, too easily? And is that more of a strength based thing as well? So, um, and also what are the goals for the child? And I guess come out of it, but, the flat-footed bit wouldn't would, is an educational point. I think that that was where I would go with that. Unless there's really are some significant issues with asymmetry and stuff like that as well. But other than that, I'd I'd, I'd be going down more of that functional assessment. Cool. And let's let's lean on the the the. The key thing here, which is everyone's take on the, I guess, the treatment, for want of a better word, of the asymptomatic flat foot in a, in a PEDS patient. Where, where do we sit with that? Can I just get everyone's kind of whistle-stop tour of everyone's opinions on that? Treatment is reassurance as well as anything else. We can provide lots of treatment, be it um, mutual agreement in what is normal, and it is about mutual agreement and addressing um, fact versus fiction. Um, and treatment can be anything from reassuring them their child is going to be okay through to provision of um, or recommendations of footwear through to um, flat foot might be an appearance, but it might actually be functionally affecting, affecting the child. So we've all just discounted a lot of this or we've talked about what the child actually might be clumsy and we might refer them to an exercise physiologist or we might um, get them a really good uh, strength and conditioning coach or we might actually treat um, and, and the flat feet might be just one of the things because the kid's a bit floppy all over. So right. treatment can be all of those things um, of which orthoses may or may not play a part that you just want to for me, I'd want to have a really good rationale around why, why I'm introducing them. Hey, Kylie, I, I know you and I have talked about this before several times. I probably know what your answer is. But what if... Why are you both, <laughs> well, <laughs> Because this is our show and you're our guest. Um, what, <laughs> oh, what, what, what? I'll go and get this masking tape over my mouth shortly. Um, what, what if both parents was, was, had symptomatic flat feet? Um, yeah, look, that actually might change things for me, Craig. It, it would be um, why they had symptomatic flat feet, just because their foot, um, the, the, the dad might have been a pro footballer and are now hugely overweight. And symptomatic flat feet might be um, he, he stands on his feet for 15 hours a day and is overweight and has other medical conditions. They're, they're too complex to pick apart in a panel discussion like this. It's treat the patient in front of you. Yes, I might treat it, but I might treat it with something as simple as changing their footwear. I, mean, I, I, yeah, I might I, treat it with orthoses. Yeah, I would yeah. rarely use a custom. No, I mean, I, I agree totally. I, 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 guess, I guess for me, it's the, 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 the decision to treat or not to treat is based on the risk of problems happening. And, yeah. And that decision... We don't have crystal balls. No, that, yeah. but, that, but that decision in, rests on a continuum and there is a line in the sand. I think the, the, the whole debate mm -hmm. around this is where do you draw that line in the sand? Some people are going to draw it over here and some people are going to put it over here and that's never going to be resolved. Yeah. No, the people yeah. have been arguing this for years and years and years, and it mm. is that line keeps moving. Mm. Oh, well, I it's think it's, it has moved a lot. <laughs> well, I think the, the evidence base for it is really hard to keep on top with as well. I mean, if you, you can just do a simple search on PubMed. I mean, I'm sorry, Cal, I'm going to draw references in here. Mm. But if you do a simple search on PubMed, which I've just done, and um, <laughs> yeah, we were talking. <laughs> yeah, of course you have. <laughs> Put it on the screen, Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> I can, I can. You want me to? Yeah, do. There we go. Please share, share. 
Oh. Yeah, no, do it, Matt. Do it. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. <laughs> if anyone draws on his screen, you're in trouble. You want to draw on my screen, James or Nina. Right. Have you got that on my screen now? Yeah. No. Uh, there you go. So even, oh, if, here we go. so even if I look last year, for last year, one year, we've got 53 results to try and keep yeah. on touch with. So if we take it all the way back to 1914, we've got 573 papers there. Um, and that's a relatively you know, quick and dirty search uh, that I've done on uh, paediatric pest players. I haven't put all the terms in for uh, what could potentially be referred to as pest plainness as well. So, you know, it's quite, high. it's obviously been studied to the nth degree um, and there's still no clear cut answer uh, as to you know how to treat asymptomatic or even symptomatic pest pain, uh, I don't think it's something that we're going to get to get to the, the root of really in a minute on this uh, webinar, not webinar, on this um, pod chat. Um, but I think, as Kylie s said, uh, it's it's what does it what does it come associated with? It's not necessarily the the foot postural presentation itself. It's what it, it's what it's associated with. Um, and I think, you know, you can't start drawing up potentials as well, because, you know, that's very difficult to do because there's just so many variables to try and draw in to say how this would uh, po possibly progress. I mean, there is absolutely no evidence out there to say that treating foot orthosis has any uh, long term structural effects with uh, any, cor any sort of corrective device, as far as I'm aware. Is that pretty much what everybody else is? take on the evidence is so i mean you thank can't you. give it thank you you can't, you can't give them a foot orthosis now and say you know it's going to stop deterioration in the long term there's just absolutely no evidence that suggests that at all and th those will stop, that stop your share now matt stop sorry your share. Stop, stop my share stop your share yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and sometimes when you actually jump in and actually tell i'll explain to parents that that you know a set of um orthotics are more like you know, glasses rather than a set of you know braces for your teeth that's when the penny drops for them they go oh okay so i don't need to do this now i don't feel like i'm you know being a bad parent and sometimes that oh. is enough in a in a session with a parent just to put their mind at ease and they they feel that relief that they hadn't missed something yeah. where someone else brought it up with them so this father you know who's a professional athlete who's father-in-law is an orthopedic surgeon he made him rushed into that room in this situation thinking have i not allowed my child to have the best chance and have i missed something and sometimes that education at this point is well i don't think it's a foot but it may actually be all the other things we spoken spoke about and maybe you're a really good strength and conditioning or EP physio and podiatry input from a musculoskeletal point of view, from a strength and agility point of view is actually probably more what he needs rather than don't worry about the foot at this stage, at this stage, let's work on everything else first. I mean, the other thing is he's 12, so he could be hitting his prepubertal growth spurt. So his anthropometrics would be changing during that time as well. So tight, you know, tightness, weakness could play a part as well. Cause I mean, I do remember reading a study, uh, between 12 and 13, where your, your, your body proportions change because your long bones tend to grow faster than your irregular bones. And they tend to have an altered sense of their kinematics between 12 to 14. I'll have to try and find that research paper, Kylie. But yeah. We've all been 12 to 14. You get clumsy as get out because your yeah. body, you're learning every day, your body is slightly different because um, while you sleep, you grow and make memories and you wake up in the morning and your body very minutely is different during growth spurts and so and and there's different changes between girl bodies at teenage and boy bodies at teenage and all of those sort of things make such a big difference in how children perceive their own bodies so clumsiness in teenagers um is is kind of goes hand in hand with just that extra growth um, and in, in your guys' experience, just coming back to the father-in-law, um, the, the orthopedic surgeon who's, you know, you know, they know well, they trust well, and he's, you know, this consultant and he is adamant that his, his grandson needs foot orthoses. Do you find in your experience that that discussion, that education that you've talked about with, with the, the dad and his son, 
is that that belief that the father-in-law has imposed upon them, is that going to be fairly easy to break down? You're going to get quite a lot of pushback. How does that normally go in the real world? Mm. I don't know many authors that want their kids in foot orthoses, to be honest. Well, they, like being, they, like being right, they like being right, though. <laughs> Someone who likes being right. That's really the way yeah. <laughs> They usually think they're the root of all evil, don't they? Usually, I also find some bottle of those things. Um, I so, think any go, sorry, I was just going to say any family centered care. Um, I'll, I'll generally encourage a grandparent to come to the consult if, if they're concerned. I'll try and give. Um, factual handouts. We're really lucky in Australia uh, or in Victoria, a lot of our children's hospitals have grouped together and given handouts that um, have all the logos of, of all the major health services underneath them. Um, so we'll tend to use those so they get a consistent message, but also um, invite discourse and then realise you're not going to make everyone happy and just go, I did my best with what I had on the day and the evidence that was in front of me and I tried to engage the family and it is what it is. I mean, I, I would just add on <laughs> to that. I mean, I know Anthony doesn't like um, algorithms, but I think Dars and Banwell <laughs> put out quite a nice Delphi last year, was it? <laughs> was it last year for... Um, there's pest planus, uh, assessing pest planus and treating pest planus. And I, you know, I find that's quite good to give um, people who were, you know, algorithms or sometimes good to give to um, beginning clinicians in a paediatric setting. Um, so they know how to work within their remit. So I do actually quite like that um, uh, Delphi study that was done. Um, and I can't remember what was the paper, but it was DARS, I believe, in 2018. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It's good. I, I kind of refer back to that um, Angel Evans kind of um, kind of traffic light system in my head um, as one of the things that I go through, and I actually explain that out to parents when they're coming in for asymptomatic flat feet. Um, that I'd very rarely um, treat unless there was some really outlying kind of reasons why. Is it, is it worth bringing up at this point, perhaps a bit controversial, as much as we, we look at foot posture, um, are there any sort of things about a flat foot that would concern you? Um, we were discussing this uh, the, other, the other day. Um, so when you look at a foot, is, are there certain things that would cause you concern? So say, for instance, um, we talk about those feet that perhaps have um, quite significant change in two planes or... If you were getting a, a child to hop or jump, they were landing really hard. I mean, is are the are the things that would sort of trigger your concerns a little differently, despite them being flat? Is there something that you would find in assessment that you thought that those are the quirky little things about these feet that make me concerned? Does that make sense? Or is no one going to join in this conversation? <laughs> Come on, put them out there. <laughs> I think it comes back to your assessment, Nina. Like, you've, you're exactly right. Just because it's a flat foot doesn't mean you don't do your full assessment. Like, that, that family's come in for your opinion, for your professional advice. You still have a look at that entire individual and you still complete your full assessment, whatever that looks like, whether it's a gallop or your own tick the box thing. I don't think you ever do stop doing those things. So you're absolutely right. That child that lands really heavily, are we talking about the fact that they've got a bite and score, a bait and score, whatever you'd like to call it, is way out there and we're actually looking at something around a hypermobility and you've got low tone or don't talk to Kylie about planes because she'll do this at you and she's got no idea when you said that before. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think you've, you're spot on. You don't ever stop thinking that a flat foot is just simply a flat foot. You look at the person in front of you. Mm. And I think it's, it's important as well if, if you've got a 12 year old that's not, um, I'm going to say, you're, you're saying clumsy, but if, if perhaps we did get them hopping and jumping, they really should have that neuromuscular maturity as well for that age. Yeah, and, yeah. And it's absolutely. all about the, the, the timeline of that. So that, that would um, cause concern for me. Um, I think the other thing when you do get these, these situations as well is it's, it's, it's like the, the earlier one where uh, they're an early walker and they've got this curly toe. It's, um, 
in this case it's well I can see a flat foot therefore it must be that and I think people try and rationalize um, what is actually causing the problem and it's usually by what they can physically see yep. and I think a lot of these issues are down to sometimes other stuff that you can't see like that neurological control and you can't explain you can't, you can't get people to see it and it's, it's quite a hard one to convey sometimes so yeah mm. Um, <laughs> brilliant, Craig. Is there anything that's coming? My comments down on my screen no, is frozen. Is there anything? No, there's no, anything nothing. We need to address nothing worth reporting. But why, why everyone was talking? I, I was just and, and please don't attack me for sharing this one. Um, I know I sent this to Kylie and Alicia, but that, but a lot of what we've just uh, been talking. Yeah, no, I know Kylie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of, <laughs> but to oh, me, God, it, this. this this paper sums up a lot of the problem of a lot of what we're talking about. It's around the language. It's around, um, and, and this belief in this paper is quite prevalent. Um, it, it's quite we, a common belief. And this isn't the offer this one. We will it? address that we've sent a letter to the chief editor <laughs> around that, but then yeah. COVID nineteen happened. And yeah. so we are giving the chief editor um, a, a some um, time, time, mm. and then we will actually be um, trying to address that because mm. um, there's so much non-science in that. It's oh. actually a really disappointing um, oh. article. Okay, but on that, oh, there was one question that I actually, um, we haven't been able to address, and I think it's a really important question. Sorry, I'm watching things too. It was about seeing kids in their home um, who may potentially be vulnerable. And when you're um, doing telehealth, how telehealth um, interfaces with that. And I, I think it's really important. We haven't really talked about vulnerable kids that much, and we haven't, because it's such a, a challenging thing to talk about um, telehealth. Oh, sorry, there's my cat. Um, telehealth gives the ability to see Catwoman. so many <laughs> crazy cat woman. Uh, telehealth gives us the ability to see so many different things. Telehealth can make children more comfortable because they are in their own homes, and kids sometimes can be used to talking to their friends over over. Um, video platforms so you see a different side of children but it does also give you a very privileged insight into how that child is living and what their family circumstances are what's going on in the background if there's sibling fighting or if there's um, a, a, a family that um, appears very harmonious um, versus a family that may be very chaotic because that's the way their family works telehealth can actually identify those things and we need to really give a, a, a holistic picture of where children fit in um, and know when to escalate things with our um, our colleagues if we if we have to or bounce an idea off someone who understands um, sometimes child protection a little bit more but I think there's a lot of opportunities with um, protecting vulnerable children that we we probably haven't um, been able to talk about too much. You know, I'd most probably reiterate that because I think we get a rather false perspective of their um, social situation when they come into clinics because all we see is the patient in front of them. We don't get that, we don't get that family life picture or, um, you know, domestic picture, which, you know, can sometimes be quite surprising if you've ever had to go into a child protection um, case theory to hear about um, what you, you expect as a normal, typical child in a normal, typical family. But when you hear the whole the story coming out in these child protection situations about the family life, about the lack of the domestic care, it's quite it's quite eye opening. I think you've, I think we sometimes live in a rather blinkered world uh, in our clinical settings. Okay, look, I think on that yeah. note, I mean, it's obviously, obviously an important issue, but the the hour has gone Hi. by. So, um, so thanks so much, everyone. Um, really good to see so many Australians come on, but late, but so many there um, for the live. So look, th thanks, guys. So, so thanks so much. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. It was brilliant. Thank you.